Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. As we celebrated our first year anniversary, I've been reflecting back as to why I started this podcast. And one of the inspirations was my learning of and reading Dr. Duana Welch's books and research. She's been a tremendous inspiration to me and her philosophy rung true and made sense. And we want to revisit her trilogy. And let me share with you, for me, reading her work, speaking with her, getting to know her really opens up my heart and my ability to navigate the dating world at this point in my life. I didn't understand before I read her work that dating and finding love is not a random thing. I didn't understand that it's not something that just happens. And I didn't understand what was necessary in order to prepare myself to date, whether through an introduction, meeting somebody or online. We did three episodes with Dr. Welch this past year, The Science of Love, Finding Love Online at Any Age, and Exploring Relationship Attachment Styles. Each of those episodes gives us insight and skills to understand what we're looking for. You know, I call them boundaries many times when I think about it, and I get lots of inquiries as to how to approach dating, what to do. I call them boundaries. I call them self-respect. So when you read through and you weave through the episodes and Dr. Welch's philosophy, I think what you learn and what you hear is if you understand yourself, if you understand the science of love, the science of dating, if you are self-respecting, love happens. But we don't want to just find any love, right? Because anybody could hook up. Anybody could find something that looks like love or maybe feels like love. Maybe it's lust. I don't know. But we want to find the right kind of love. Many times people do that through online dating in this day and age. In 2022, there were over 366 million online dating services, and it's estimated by 2023, there'll be 441 million active users. It's an industry that also generates billions of dollars. In 2022, it was estimated that internet dating generated almost $3 billion in the U.S. Online dating, if that's the way you want to move forward, is something that has something for everybody. You know, there's all kinds of dating apps and different age groups use different dating apps. When you speak with the 18 to 29 year old group, and I have a 23 year old, they use Tinder or Hinge. The 30 to 64 year old crowd, which now I'm beyond, which is kind of scary, uh, prefer Match. It's thought to be a more serious site and it works because there are lots of marriages or committed relationships that come out of it. Users over 65, interestingly, statistics show us, uh, prefer eHarmony or religious or very specific sites. And the great thing about these sites is that there is something for everybody. In fact, I was listening to an interview with Bumble's CEO founder, Whitney Wolf Hurd. She's in the business of love. She created Bumble in 2014. Since then, it's seen 100 million users worldwide. And that's a site that allows women to make the first move. Interesting approach. They're now moving towards expanding the site to permit people to find social groups, friends, activities. People are lonely. They don't want to be lonely. I think post-COVID, you know, during COVID, a lot of people were lonely. They realized that they want other things. So I think the whole way people are connecting is changing. But you don't need to meet somebody just on a dating app. You can meet somebody at the supermarket or through a fix-up with somebody. I'm a big believer in fixing people up. I've done it many times. Sometimes it's worked. Sometimes it hasn't. I just recently fixed up the daughter and son of two of my childhood friends from different areas of my life. They're in their 30s going strong, and we got our fingers crossed. 
But I'm a big believer in introducing people because there's such joy in seeing somebody find their person. If that's what they're looking for, if you're not looking for it, that's okay. And, and it's hard to meet people organically, especially since a lot of people are working from home now. However you meet your person, you got to understand the fundamentals, which is what inspired us to revisit Dr. Dwayne Wilch's trilogy of interviews because her philosophy is unusual. I mean, rarely do you read something where you go, wow, it's a light bulb moment. But with Dr. Welch's work, it was a couple of years ago that I came across her work and acted on it and did a little research through her work, sort of used her approach to meet people and filter people out. In fact, it was reading her work and looking at things differently that in many ways inspired me to launch this podcast. Those of us who want love, a certain kind of love, are on a journey. And I'm hopeful that this podcast in this episode helps you on that journey because this has helped me tremendously. And I want to be on that journey with you. I get lots of inquiries as to, is love possible? Can you recover from heartbreak? I hear from many of our listeners who talk about hopeful lives that have evolved after heartbreak. So we're all on this journey. You know, we're all in this together. What I've learned is that in order to find love, you you know, it sounds like such a cliche, you got to love yourself, but there's a lot of truth to it. You have to be self-respecting and you have to know that sometimes rejecting somebody or being rejected is part of the process. And if you look at it more clinically and you understand that it's not as painful, to tell you the truth, and I've lived it, you know, I'm not above it. I believe if you want a partner, you'll find a partner. Sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes it's not easy, but there is no doubt in my mind. As I've said before, my mother, may she rest in peace, used to say there's a lid for every pot. Well, there is. As you listen to this episode, I want you to know I am right there with you. I am living this as you're living this. I'm listening and learning every day. I'm rooting for you, but I'm rooting for you because I know that it's possible to have success. Been there, living it, doing it. So without further ado, let's listen to Dr. Welch's philosophy. I hope it inspires you and I hope it leads you to what your heart wants. Dr. Welch is an author of the well-known book, Love Factually. She's a dating coach. She's a professor. She's somebody who guides clients as they navigate the online dating world. The interesting thing about Duane's work and the unusual thing is she relies upon science, not opinion, to help people find each other. And I plan that this conversation will be the first in a series of discussions about love. We want to talk about what we've been told about love versus what it actually is and what makes it work. But before Dwayne and I talk about her groundbreaking research, you should know that I was introduced to Dwayne's work earlier this year. And after reaching out to her thinking, well, we're both in the relationship business, we should talk. We began a series of what I perceived, and I hope she did, fascinating discussions about our respective work in the relationship business and about our lives. And I was really drawn to her theories, not just because of what she wrote and how she spoke, because she walked the walk. She was vulnerable and transparent, and you'll find her to be so today. And that inspired me because authenticity matters, especially when you're talking about matters of the heart. Dwayne, I've shared with you that your unique perspective has certainly changed the way I see dating and the way I see relationships in love. Thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to every one of our conversations. So, Duana, in your book, you have all these steps and guidelines to finding and keeping love. Doesn't real love, I mean, true love, just find us? You know about the law of attraction that says if we just, you know, envision what we want, it'll happen. That is not true or else, you know, everybody would be healthy, wealthy and wise, right? But isn't that what we grow up thinking? I mean, we grow up, especially as young girls, thinking that this magical moment's going to happen and the rest, you know, love will take care of. Well, yeah, that's another myth is that we don't have to look. You know, there's a word for people who stop looking or don't look to begin with, and that word is single. I was unexpectedly single a couple years ago. I love that phrase, by the way, unexpectedly single. (laughs) It's a great phrase. I'm going to use that. 
Yeah. <laughs> Unexpectedly single a couple of years ago. And I was taking a walk in my neighborhood and, you know, people around here know what I do. And a woman who's about my age came out in her front yard. We were talking, of course, socially distanced because it's right in the middle of the pandemic. And she said, you know, I hope you won't look because if you look, that'll keep it from happening. That's one of the mating myths that if I want it badly, or if I actively search that I'm going to ruin my odds. It's kind of like, you know, when you go into a house with a cat, if you don't look at the cat, the cat will come to you. People think that about love. Right. They do. They think, you know, you're magically somebody's going to appear. And that's why people are so uncomfortable about online dating, but people don't know what they're looking for. Discomfort with online dating is its very own thing. Discomfort with looking at all. You may have a friend who ran into his or her future mate in a coffee shop and they just struck up a conversation and they couldn't stop talking and they realized we need to see each other again. They wound up happily married, but it's not the way to bet. Science shows the odds of an event happening. It doesn't show the certainty. So we know, for example, that six out of 10 smokers die from smoking. That's what kills them is a cancer related to smoking. But it's not 100% of them, and we don't know which six people it'll be. So when I'm talking about odds during any of our podcasts, what I'm saying is, here's what happens to most people most of the time. Here's how to hedge your bets. I wouldn't buy a car if the salesperson said, you know, this is a great car, but six out of 10 people unfortunately die in a fiery explosion. Uh, Okay, show me something else. So when I tell you about the odds, the odds are very high that you're not going to accidentally meet your future mate once you are past about 25 or so. So how do you increase those? How do you identify what you're looking for? Are there tools that you recommend that we use to help us identify who we're looking for? Absolutely. And I want to answer the question to begin with, with a rhetorical question, which is, if you were going to take a vacation, would you get in your car with no GPS, no maps, and start driving and just hope you end up where you think you're going to end up? Nobody would do that, but we do it in love all the time. I want you all to have a roadmap to take you where you want to go. And this is not magical thinking. I'm not saying if you make this list, the right person will appear. But if you make this list, you will stop wasting time in dead end relationships. You'll know more readily when you're encountering someone who doesn't match your list. And you'll know when you meet somebody who has. And what's really wonderful is every now and then I will get an engagement announcement or wedding photos from someone who said, I made the list and I realized that my person was at my workplace. And we've talked for years and I didn't realize, oh, that's the one. So, so in your book, you refer to this as your desired traits list. Yeah. And your traits are very specific about directing people to write down what is required and, and not to deviate from that. Right. Seems a little clinical. Okay. So one of the questions I frequently get asked by my clients is, so do you do all this stuff? And of course I do everything that I teach other people to do because science, it works. And as you also know, I got in a really happy relationship almost a year ago and I used all of this in order to do it. And I'm now 53. So, you know, most people wouldn't consider those the salad days for women looking for a partner. These strategies work. The most important work I do with clients perhaps is making this list. And it is very specific. I ask people for to just brainstorm absolutely everything they can think of that they want or need in a partner. And some people don't really know. So what I say is think about all your past relationships and the things that you did and didn't like and put that on your list. And don't say to yourself, well, I can't have that or am I being realistic or you know, there aren't enough people like that in the world. Just write it all down. And it might initially start with doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't put down his mother when he talks, whatever. It might be negative at first, but I have people write down everything and then I have them go back through the list and make it all positive. So instead of doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, it could be abstains from use of legal or illegal substances for recreational purposes. Why do you think it's important to put it in a positive uh, spin as opposed to a negative? Don't think about the white polar bear. You're thinking about the white polar bear right now, aren't right, you? Right, got it. So our brain fails to process the word not. Not a smoker. Now who are you looking for? A smoker. What's happening with this list is you are doing something that is known scientifically as priming. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but maybe if you've heard a phrase in a movie and you catch yourself saying that same phrase a couple of days later and you think, I've never said that before, and you didn't really intend to say it, that's because your brain was primed. You have neural connections that grow and that are more likely to be activated if you've encountered the information recently. You no, know, it's fun is I've never said this on a podcast before. So I went through this exercise and I spoke with you about it, and it was 
shocking to me the things that I actually had to admit were important to me when I wrote them down. You know, they're the kind of things you think about, but you don't want to really admit are all that important. They are. And going through this exercise really helped me narrow my span of people that I would date. And I hate to say if they don't check the box, but if they're not checking the box, I'm going to be true to myself and just acknowledge there might be other qualities, but these aren't it. So that was a really powerful exercise. And my list was long. I thought, oh my God, maybe that's why I'm saying Oh, my list is too long, right? But it was it was an interesting, fascinating exercise because you have to talk about qualities and, and, and finances and, and kindness and all kinds of things that maybe you think are going to magically happen because doesn't love conquer all. I, I think yeah, the thing is, if I wish it did. It sure doesn't will matter. So there's research by uh, Holmberg and Holmes that sh- in uh, I believe 1990s they looked at more than 400 couples when they first got married, and they found that all these couples described themselves as very happy. And then they found them two years later, all the same people. And of course, two years and- later, some people are no longer very happy because you know about half of all divorces that are ever going to happen, happen in the first seven years. And most of them happen in the first two years. You know this from- Right. That's what I do. Exactly. So a lot of times though, it was that people fell in love without having the skills to back it up. And Let's talk they, about that. What does that mean? Well, they don't know, for example, how to show kindness and respect, even when they've had a bad day or they disagree with one another. That's a huge one. They make assumptions about each other without clearing them up in a kind, respectful way. I will say two standards that belong on everyone's list are that this person is kind and respectful, whether the other person that they're dealing with or the animal they're dealing with has any power, no matter whether this person has had a good or a bad day, no matter what's going on in their life, their default setting is kindness and respect, which is not just a character trait. It's something we can all work on. But well, you know, someone I, is unkind things, or disrespectful but... to you at the beginning of a relationship, that does not get better. About a year ago, shortly before I, I met my person, I had met this guy while I was walking my dog. And he seemed to be the whole enchilada. I mean, he had a PhD and a law degree. Do you know what that does for someone like me? <laughs> he was fascinating. And he, we started talking every day. He asked for my number and we were talking on the phone every night and we were just having a great time. And he asked me to be his girlfriend. And this is during pandemic. So we'd never been within six feet of each other. So we're six feet apart the whole time. And he says, I want you to be my girlfriend. I want to take you on a real date. And I said, delighted to do that wonderful. So we made a plan to quarantine for two weeks so that we could be within six feet of each other and a plan for him to pick me up. And he instantly started doing things that don't work in a long-term relationship. And I mean, I do what I do for a living. So I see these things very clearly. Like what? Well, like I live one street over from a very large, beautiful park and he took his dog on a walk there. He has to drive to get to the park. And he didn't let me know he was there. A man who's just asked you to be his woman does not go within a few yards of you and not ask you to join him. Okay. But that's something that I now know after our conversations, but there might've been a time where I might've made an excuse for that. We all make excuses. You know, he wanted to be alone that day. He's been close in other ways. But that to you was a red flag. It was a red flag. And and so I did, I don't know if we're ever going to do a podcast on attachment style, but yes, that's, I love that topic. Yeah, it's super important. And one of the things that I believe went wrong for some of the couples that Holmberg and Holmes studied was that some of them had an attachment style mismatch that was unworkable unless you know a lot about it, unless you self-educate and maybe get therapy about it. And so I recognize that while I have a secure attachment style, he has an avoidant one. And so you could have all the right traits, and this has happened to me, all the right traits, check all the boxes. But if your attachment styles are not the same or your understanding of a relationship is not the same, it's not going to work. Is that what you're telling us? What I'm really telling you is that people don't all have the same capacity or desire for love. That's my, a very powerful statement. Yeah, it's really, when when that thought hit me that that summarized this enormous area of research on attachment style that people don't all have the same capacity and desire for love. I realized, oh my gosh, a huge part of this is finding someone whose capacity and desire for love matches mine. I have had an anxious attachment style and now I'm secure. Both of those types of styles have a very high capacity and desire and ability to love. Whereas people with 
and avoidance style do not value intimacy as much. And therefore they don't put as much into it and they don't develop as much love. They're not as willing almost ever. I'm not saying that can't change, but it's probably not going to change with you. That's not the way to bet. And so I recognize this guy was doing things like all of a sudden he expected me to do half the courting. That's not a good sign. Men who are secure or even who are anxious, they want to court you. This was him throwing down the gauntlet, creating a power struggle where there wasn't one. And I recognized what was going on. So when that happened that night, I'd been observing for about a week at this point. Also, he went to a party after we were quarantining, which meant that our date had to be put off even further. Look, a guy who really wants you, if he has to quarantine two weeks to see you, he's not going to wait four days into it and go, "Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to go to this thing. So, you know, you list the personality traits, right? And and by the way, you were talking about kindness. I, I think probably one of the most common themes in people that I see whose divorce or ending is they stopped being kind to each other a long time ago. Yeah, you can't um, ever stop. And and that's right. It is probably the, the, the most significant thing that happens to a marriage that ends it. There is a disregard for emotion. There's no more kindness. There's no more sensitivity. And it will kill a relationship. Yeah, it's about these traits. So I actually asked him on the phone that night. I had observed for about a week that he was pulling back. I said, you know, I think we might have done the girlfriend thing a little quickly. I'm seeing some signs of some pullback and I'd like to talk about that. And That's what secure people do. And it's what I try to teach a lot of my non-secure clients to do is when you see something, say something, but say it kindly. Don't say, you don't love me or you don't like me. or you Start with an I statement. I'm noticing this. I'm wondering what it means. Ask open-ended questions. Be accepting. Be open. So I did that and he just lit into me. He took things I had told him in confidence and used them against me in the conversation. And here's that was the end of that. Oh yeah. But, but you say that as if, well, that's a foregone conclusion. Almost everyone I've ever worked with, it wouldn't have been the end. They would have tried to accommodate the person. Of course. They would have asked what's wrong with, with me. In fact, I will go so far as to say nobody I have ever worked with would have left right then. I did because what have I been doing for all these years? What was really interesting is that I found out from other people who knew him that this is how he treats women. So I had already left him. I sent him a Dear John email and said, unfortunately, the level of unkindness and disrespect in that call has made it where I can't interact with you anymore. And that makes me really sad. But basically, our work here is done. And he he responded with an even more cruel response. And I thought, good to know. Good to know. Kindness. Yeah. I know this is tough. I know it's tough because I've done it only recently. I want you to Maya Angelou, your dating scenario. When somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. One of my favorite expressions. You have to be kind and respectful all the way through. And when you first meet somebody, they're showing the very best they're capable of. If the very best your potential person is capable of is showing you unkindness and disrespect the first moment they feel that they're under threat or the first moment that they've had a bad day, they are telling you who they are. Run. But the trick is, and I have learned this, through our discussions and through my reading, that when you see that it will not get better and it's going to hurt for just a bit, but it is a very, very necessary tool to have because it will not get better. Yeah, you, mean, you've just yeah. touched on a, a concept that I talk about a lot with clients, which is you're in for pain either way. You know, if you stay with this person, the worst way that someone treats others is the way that you will eventually be treated by them. I, I would like to say it's a law of psychology. And so when you when you see that... You're in for pain if you leave them because at this point you are kind of attached to them, but you're in for a lot more pain if you stay because that's how you're going to get treated and life's too short. And and it is a certainty that you will not stay together. People who are unkind and disrespectful over the long haul are people who disconnect, become lonely and leave each other. You know, Dwayne, one of the other things that you write about and we've spoken about is asking the hard questions. I want to talk about that because it seems so, I don't know, unromantic as you're courting to ask those hard questions. What do you mean by that? This gets back to something that we started talking about really early in this interview. You asked me, you know, does this kind of ruin your romance for dating, knowing all these facts about relationships? I, by the way, will not date ever again until I do this. And I now do that when I date. So preaching to the converted, as they say, because I think (laughs) it's brilliant. I think it's the most brilliant tool I've ever heard. It just clears out so much. Yeah, well, I just want to preface this with, 
Just like learning all about digestion didn't ruin my enjoyment of a meal, knowing all about the process of successfully partnering will not ruin your enjoyment of falling in love. It won't. What it will do is it will eliminate people who can never give you what you need. And therefore it will end a lot of the hurt in your life. It's not going to end the love. It's going to make it much more likely. And that's what I want for everyone. So the hard questions. We're going back to the list. Are you getting the impression the list is important? (laughs) But when you ask the questions is when you're really being honest with yourself that you're prepared for the answers. Yes. And there's two aspects of that. One is, well, three, what questions are you going to ask? How are you going to ask them? And how are you going to answer them? Because anything you ask is fair game. Let's start with anything you ask can ask is fair game. Yeah. What's too much to ask? What's too little to ask as you're getting to know somebody? So I want you all to have that list and go over your list and make sure that you come up with ways to assess that. For example, uh, is this person kind and respectful? Well, you can't ask people, are you kind and respectful? Everybody will say yes to that because it's socially desirable to say yes. And people want to think the best about themselves. You know, in research, 90% of drivers think they're better drivers than 90% of drivers. So you can't ask people that and get a real answer, but you can look at their behavior. On the other hand, there are some things that you just have to ask about. Because you're not going to talk them into anything or out of anything, particularly at a certain age. Well, I'm pretty convinced you're really just not going to talk them into or out of anything anyhow. But yeah, I, I think that's really a smart thing to do. I think people are naive in that regard and they think they could. There are certain things that should be deal breakers and you should know them up front. Yeah, exactly. So as humorous Dave Barry said, famously. If they're nice to you, but rude to the waiter, they're not a nice person. That's how you assess kindness and respect. Look at their behavior. Look especially at what they say about former partners, because the worst way they talk about any former partner is how you're going to be talked about. And the question there is, if your ex were here right now, what would they say was the reason the relationship ended? You're listening for the answer because they'll almost always tell you the, the true answer if you frame it that way. But you're also listening for what they say about their ex and how they say it. So one of my deal breakers, and I, I've shared this with you, is how they have resolved conflict in the past. And particularly since I'm a divorce lawyer, I don't want to hear about your divorce problems or your anger or your alimony obligations. And if you ask somebody about that, that is a very revealing question because if they're still angry or they're still talking about how, you know, they were taken advantage of that for me is a deal breaker, process it, figure it out, go to therapy, but I'm not going to sit here and talk about it. So that's a perfect example of an upfront question. It's a fine line. You're trying to ask very meaningful questions in a very kind way. So I'll give you an example from my own search. Uh, My boyfriend and I live a couple hours apart. And of course, we knew this from the first meeting. And I have met so many people in my line of work who they lived X amount of distance apart and they didn't have the discussion early and years go by and they break up because they live far apart and it's not resolvable for them. So I was really enjoying talking to this guy. And I said, I'm really enjoying talking to you. And that actually means that I have to ask you kind of a hard question because I don't want to like you even more if this isn't workable. There's no point in it. I'm just wondering if this were to work out, would you be willing to move where I am? Because I really like it here. That's a tough question to ask while you're still talking on the phone and you haven't been involved yet. Oh, it was the first conversation. His response obviously was yes, because you're still together. Well, his response was, of course, you do what you need to for the person that you love. People often say, well, I had this long, bad relationship, but I learned so much from it. Here's what I want for you. I want you to have short dates that you learned so much from and a single long relationship that sustains you. There is someone out there who is looking for you specifically for what you have to offer and the constellation of, of who you are. There is someone who is looking for you. And here's the thing. If you are mucking around with the wrong person, they don't get to find you and you don't get to have them. During our last episode, we talked about the fact that people are uncomfortable going online to find love. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. When Dwayne and I were preparing for today and talking about this episode, it occurred to both of us that people take directions from professionals for all kinds of things. You go to the doctor, you're sick, you get prescribed medicine or tests, you follow the directions. You don't understand them necessarily. If you have a legal issue or a tax issue, You go to a professional and you do what they say, not necessarily understanding it. And if your car breaks down, you go to a mechanic, they tell you what to do. And for the most part, you say, okay, if that's what it costs, then I'll follow your directions. But 
What fascinates me is that people don't do that when it comes to healing their heart or finding love. They don't take direction from a professional. We invest in meeting somebody with superficial things. We buy new clothes for a date. We put on makeup, maybe get a little Botox. We spend thousands of dollars on matchmakers who really just put us together and don't understand who we are. But we don't invest in a professional that will give us the tools to find a heart connection. In any event, I've come to the conclusion, sometimes you just got to follow directions. And I believe love will happen. More importantly, Dr. Welch knows how to tell us that'll happen. Dwayna, what is the first thing we do to get mentally prepared to how to find love online? You know, for a lot of people, it's just overcoming their hesitations about what they believe about online dating. I think people in their 20s, 30s, maybe even partway up into their 40s now, there's no stigma about online meeting online anymore. But when you get above that age point, a lot of people still feel like there's a stigma. There isn't. That's all made up. It, it doesn't exist anymore. It's a perfectly legitimate way to meet. It's rapidly supplanting the former most common way to meet, which was through friends and family. And there's research that shows that at least if you use a site that gives a lot of information about you, not just a picture and a few words, but a lot of information, that the marriages that are formed from such sites are slightly happier than the marriages formed through friends and family. Isn't that interesting? So once you get mentally prepared, we all know about the famous profile. You have to write a profile. How the heck do you write a profile that captures who you are in a few paragraphs? Because it's critical to identify what you're looking for. How do you do that? Hmm. Well, you don't. That's the short answer. And when I say you don't, I mean two things. Number one, if you can, hiring a professional to do this for you can really help. And the second thing is you don't because you don't write about you. You write about them. What I mean by that is go online at any site. Go to uh, Match, go to OkCupid, go to Tinder, go to Bumble, go to Hinge, whatever app or site you're using, and look at how people deal with the profile section. They write about themselves. You know what? People's eyes glaze over. What people are really interested in is them. What you need to do is present a profile that is about your future partner, not about you. The irony is by presenting a profile about your future partner, you are also presenting information about you because I know for a fact from doing this work and from research that what people ask for is who they are. What do you mean? Give me some more examples of that, the nuts and bolts of that. Yeah, the nuts and bolts of this involve, first of all, writing down a list of everything you have to have and everything you'd like to have. I call them must-haves and wants. And must-haves are exactly that. They're the things that if any of these things were lacking, even if the person was otherwise perfect, if even one must have was lacking, it's a deal buster. You just can't go forward with the relationship. So in other words, the must haves portion of your list is not pass fail. It's not like if they get 70% good enough, it has to be 100% on the must haves or you're going to be unhappy. That's why it's a must have. How does one incorporate that into a profile on a dating site? Well, what you do is you write out your must haves and your wants, and then you write out a profile that describes this person in terms of your must haves. I can give you an example. I mean, I wrote, Please my, do. obviously I wrote my own ad and unlike other people's ads, I have permission to share mine because I have permission from me. So I've got it right here on my desk. I'll just read you a little bit of it and this will give you an Please idea. Do. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that were on my list. I wanted somebody who loves kissing. That's an important thing to me. Loves kissing. Loves kissing. I wanted somebody who takes the traditional lead in courtship for reasons that anybody who reads my books will know. It's not because I'm a traditionalist. I've never changed my name. I've got a PhD and I cut my own hair. I'm not a traditionalist, but... No, you're not. <laughs> and that's why we love you, but go ahead. <laughs> but I know that marriage is better for us than cohabiting emotionally in terms of our health, our wealth, our safety, everything. I know that it's better for us. I know that courtship that happens where if you're heterosexual, the guy takes the lead works out better than if the couple shares it 50-50. That sounds so old fashioned to me, Duena. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I marched, burned my bra did all the stuff in the seventies. Are you telling me now I've got to wait for some guy to pursue me? You don't have to, you can do anything you want. Well, I don't want to pursue anybody because I feel like at this point in my life, I want to be pursued, but I think it sounds sort of old fashioned that you put that on your list. If I may challenge you, my friend. You absolutely may challenge me and I'm glad you're doing it because I know okay. everybody else out there is thinking, what? Why What's would she with say this that? woman? Right. 
Yeah. Well, it's not what's with me. It's what's with science. So yesterday I was standing out in my front yard and I bought my house from a friend and my friend walked past and she was saying, so are you going to live together with your boyfriend before you get married? And I said, no. And she goes, wow, that's kind of old fashioned. And I said, it's not old fashioned. It's what works. I'm an empiricist. I go with what works for most people most of the time, which is what science is, by the way. Social science is what we know for sure works for most people most of the time. It gives best projected outcomes. That's what I do. And so what I know for sure is when things come easily to men, men do not value those things or those people. We talked a little bit about the profile. One of the questions people ask all the time is, what pictures do I use? And from what I know, I don't, you know, I've been told about other women's sites. Men who have been on dates with say that women sometimes use these really provocative photos or photos that are from 20 years ago. How do you guide somebody is to choose the pictures that they put on their site? What's appropriate? What's not? You know, one of my favorite things is writing somebody's profile right in front of them. So I have their buy-in and helping to make that list writing their profile for and with them, and then helping them to know what the parameters are for photos and then putting those photos in the right order. So one of the the parameters for photos. Well, one of the things it's funny. So as you know, I just had a new edition of love factually come out and the first edition just says, put up some good photos. Oh my, I did not know. (laughs) I wrote the first edition. Well, it it was how many years ago? I mean, things have changed. It was seven years ago. But the fact of the matter is, yes, things have changed. But human nature didn't change, as you know. I I say that. Dating has. What people are doing is they're putting up photos that they don't really seem to have much awareness of how those photos will be viewed. So let's start with the provocative photo. There is a scientist called Carrie Getz. Dr. Getz does research on sexual predators. And she finds that they look for very specific appearances in women. They look, for example, at women who are not wearing very much clothing or the clothing is very tight or very revealing. When you put those pictures online, you will get more attention from sexual predators. What I want you to do instead is put pictures that show that you have a waist, that a waist exists because men are attracted to that. If you are a heterosexual woman, put put pictures up that show that you have a waist, but don't make things overly tight or revealing. And make sure that, in addition, the background is uncluttered and attractive. No bathroom selfies, ever. No pictures of you that you think are really good, but they have your ex cropped out of them. No pictures of you that have any other person in the picture. Unless you're a guy. If you're a guy, you could have pictures of you with like your grandkids and a little note on their picture. Me and my grandkids, because yet other experiments show that women are more attracted to men showing nurturing toward a child than they are to men not shown nurturing a child, but the effect is reversed for women. In other words, if a woman puts up a picture of herself nurturing a child, men are like, "Uh, they're not that into it. You need to be on your own in these pictures. It needs to be a good picture of you. You need to be looking directly into the camera and smiling. And I don't mean just showing your teeth. I mean an eye crinkling smile, a real smile, the kind of smile that you would give to somebody that you love. Think about somebody that you love, that you adore, when you have your pictures taken. And I want your first two or three shots to be headshots. There's a science reason for that too. We know from experiments, again, experiments show cause effect. They're not merely this happens and this is related to it. They show if X, then Y. If you do this, this does happen. What these experiments show is that men who are in short-term mating mode would rather, if they're forced to choose between looking at women's bodies or women's faces, they're looking at the body. You want to get rid of these men. Again, people who are interacting with my work are people who want a long-term partnership. If somebody wants a short-term partnership, I want to make it clear, I'm not opposed to that. If you want to just go and get laid, I'm not opposed to that. People who hire me, they want a long-term relationship, which means get rid of the people who don't want what you want. And one of the ways to do that is have your first two to three pictures, and I want you to use seven pictures. Have the first two to three pictures be close in, headshots, that show your smiling, lovely face, smiling and looking directly in the camera because yet another science fact, men tend to over-perceive women's interest rather than under-perceive it. They think we're more interested than we are and how they tell that is we make eye contact and we smile. So leverage that in your online photos. Be looking straight into the lens, which is into their eyes from the user standpoint and be smiling on genuine eye crinkling smile, but don't put the best picture that you have. Don't go to some place that takes a picture of you that when the person sees you, you're not going to look that good. So, so now we're mentally prepared. 
The profile has been written about them, not you. We have an idea of the pictures to use. I realize this is a long coaching process. It doesn't just happen. What happens when somebody reaches out to you? Do you respond? How do you know how to respond? Do you reach out to them? How do you screen out people that you want to pursue or you want them to pursue them? First of all, you wrote an ad that was about them, not about you. And your ad was so compelling that if they say, nice ad, you're not even responding to that. This ad is so specific that my sweetheart saw this ad. He was in the park when my picture showed up. I was on match. He saw this ad. He thought, oh my gosh, it should have my picture under it. It's so specific. And he ran home. He was on a walk. He ran home and immediately, and he didn't say, hey, nice ad. What's up? He wrote a complete response that ended with saying that he felt like this was a great match. He couldn't wait to either meet me or talk with me. He hoped I would be in touch soon. If I could share with our listeners, you have read that to me, what he responded to you with, and it was unbelievably responsive, factually specific, and grown up. So I get that you would respond to him, and it's a good thing you did, I might note, because it's turning out pretty well. But you know, I think there's some confusion as to how to respond, and then when you do respond and you feel there's a connection, What do you do to get offline and go to a phone call or email? How do you know when to take that step? Yeah. So first of all, you're not going to take that step if someone has a deal breaker. So you've already got an ad that describes them very specifically. Then they write to you a very specific response. If they write something that's nebulous, hey, or how was your weekend? You don't even respond to that. You only respond to the people who answered in a sincere way that shows that they read your ad and they should go point by point and say, here's how I fit it. I mean, your ad will be a clarion call. You have thrown down the gauntlet in a humorous and fascinating way, but you have thrown down the gauntlet and they're going to respond likewise. The right guy is not going to see your ad and think she's perfect for me. I'm just going to say, how was your weekend? He's not going to do that. First of all, you are screening for the person who answered your ad completely. Second of all, you're going to go then to their profile and you're going to look for any deal breakers. Notice that I didn't say look for similarities. You're going to look for any deal breakers on their profile because when you answer them, it's either going to be the yes, I want to get to know you better script or the no, I don't script. And I encourage you to have these both in a word document or some kind of word processing document on your phone or your desktop so that you can send these things. You're going to send one of those responses. And if they have a deal breaker, you're going to send, Hey name, thanks so much for reaching out. I really appreciate that you took the time and effort to do that. I don't see that we have enough in common, but I really wish you great luck on your search. But I don't want our listeners to get the impression that the ads that are written, and I know when you do this work, you're playful and fun in the ads. I don't want our listeners to get the impression that this is a job description uh, because that's, you know, I, I want to share with our listeners that these ads, although they are fact specific and include must haves, are written in a playful, flirtatious, fun way. There's a big difference. And and I, I if you could just clarify that for us, that'd be great. Yeah. So first of all, they are a job description for the most important job in your entire life. The job that has more to do with your health, your wealth, your longevity, your sexuality, all kinds of life outcomes than anything else. So no pressure. <laughs> That's a perfect example. When we when we are looking for a job, we go to professionals and resume writers and we screen and we edit. And then this, we just throw up a bunch of stuff about us. So how do you move it from a, back to your question, Pat, how do you move it finally from this back and forth? People tend to do this eternally. It seems eternal back and forth online. Like they're going to be old fashioned pen pals. And this drives women crazy. They're waiting for the guy to ask for their number and he's not asking for their number. And they feel like, oh, uh, you know, a lot of women who've read books that encourage being hard to get. I don't talk about hard to get anymore. I talk about high status, which means having self-respect and boundaries. Self-respect. That's self-respect, self-respect, self and self-respect to follow your must-haves and not deviate. That's self-respecting. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, that's self-respecting. It's also self-respecting to say to yourself, you know what? Men don't value women. They don't work hard to have. And so I'm going to be super, super friendly. And my book goes into great detail about how to do this because women get very confused about this. They seem to either vacillate between doing his quote unquote job for him and courting the guy or doing absolutely nothing, being an ice queen and wondering why the guy doesn't ever warm up. So it's, it's neither of those things. It is having boundaries and self-respect while being super friendly and encouraging. That's what it is. That's a that's a that's a tightrope. I mean, that's walking a tightrope. But I will tell you when you learn to have self-respect and you learn to honor your must-have list, 
life changes. I could speak about that from personal experience. Your life changes because not that you necessarily find your person, but you know who you're not looking for. And that is life changing. You don't waste time. Yeah. And honestly, lots and lots of my clients have found the right person within a year and quite a hefty percentage have found a person within one to three months. There are really only a couple of things that you need in order to find the right person. One of those is knowing yourself. Another one is adhering rigidly to your boundaries of what you must have and saying no to everyone who doesn't fit them and finally say yes to someone who does. But there is a process getting there. That that nutshell version, you know, there's a lot of angst. People are emotional. I'm emotional. I do understand and feel a lot of compassion for people going through this because of course I've been through it and I've been through it more than once. You know, I want people to have what they need. And the good news is you can have that. The bad news is if you're stumbling around hoping it just happens, there's a word for people who do that now. And that word is usually single. So there's a difference between coaching and therapy. Best thing I ever did is got into really good therapy when my marriage ended. Uh, I still check in after 12 years. That's getting yourself partially mentally prepared. I look at coaching though, is just follow directions because you have to know yourself. So there's two silos, therapy, understanding yourself, and sometimes just shut up and follow the directions because that gets you to your end result. So there's a difference between the two. And I think people don't understand that. There is a big difference. In fact, when clients sign on with me, uh, they they sign a one page document that says, I understand that Dwayne Welch has a PhD, but she is not a therapist and is not trained as one. I did not set out to become a therapist. Therapists, what they do is they try to help you understand and moderate your emotional life. It's very important. I have a therapist that I see. I really believe in therapy. I go to therapy. I love my therapist. Just think. So do I love mine. Yeah. Just think the world of her. I encourage everyone who works with me, if they have the means to please get therapy. Coaching is a different beast. With coaching, what you are getting is someone who strategizes given your particular circumstance. I'm going to talk about how I coach because I am not as familiar with other people's processes. To my knowledge, I'm the only person using science as the backbone of why I ask people to do the things I ask them to do. But it's very directive. Your therapist is not going to say, let me help you write your profile. Your therapist is not going to say, here are the right pictures to use. Your therapist is not going to say, here's how to deal with someone who said they were going to call, but then they they didn't. Your therapist isn't going to talk about those things necessarily. They're looking at more overarching issues. And what I find is when a person can get coaching and therapy, you get really good outcomes from that. You know, therapy is basically retro parenting. It's the, the excellent parenting we all should have gotten and most of us didn't. And the, the healing that you get from a good therapist is absolutely legitimate. And I see life in many, many ways as both and. You can both get coaching and therapy. They're not the same thing but they help you get the big result you want. Again, love is so often seen in our society as a nice add-on to your life. I will tell you this, for many people, it is your life. What else can you think of that literally affects how long you live, how your children do, and your grandchildren, by the way, how much sex you have and how good the quality of sex is. And by the way, if you think that living together and being married has the same quality of sex, you would be wrong. Married people have as much sex and they have a better quality of sex than cohabitors. And both of those groups have way more sex and better quality than people who are just dating. If you want something that's going to, well, Tom W. Smith, who used to be the head of the National Institute of Health here in the U.S., he said, if there was a product that you could buy that gave you better sex, more sex, better health, better job, longer life, your kids did better. If you sold that product, you'd be a billionaire, but you don't need to sell it because it already exists. It's called marriage. And I think this is a good time to wrap up this episode. And I encourage you, if you want to find love online, I hope you listen to this and I hope you read Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps from I Wish to I Do, the new and updated version. Duena, your book covers many topics about looking for love. I mean, you talk about the myths that hold people back. You talk about being self-respecting, knowing who you are not wasting your time with the wrong partner, and you give people the encouragement to be persistent. But today, I want to talk to you about attachment styles, because to me, identifying attachment styles is a quick and extremely effective way to understand who not to date. The attachment theory aspect 
I think is the quickest, most efficient way to rule people out and pull people in. And I want to talk to you about that because you integrate the social science of attachment style into your own other research and it's life-changing. So talk to us about what the four attachment styles are. Absolutely. And just to keep it personal for just a moment, of course, I used this information. I was secure when I was growing up. I should start by saying what that means. An attachment style is our usual way of being in intimate relationships. When we're kids, our attachment is to our caregivers. When we're adults, it's to our romantic partner. As a child, I had a foundation that was very secure. But as a young adult moving on through midlife, I really was a pretty anxious attacher. We'll talk in a minute about what that means. But in a general way, it meant I knew I needed someone who had a secure attachment style because if I had that, then their secure attachment would create something that scientists called earned security, meaning I would become more secure myself just by having that kind of partner. And I knew exactly what I was looking for, which is what I'm going to share with you today. What is it you're looking for? What kind of attachment style do you have? What does this mean for your mate search? What does it mean if you want to change? All these things are really important topics that you have a lot of choice over, but only after you know some facts about it. Before you talk about the attachment styles, are there ways that people could figure out what their attachment styles are? Absolutely. There are numerous tests online that you can take. I like Levine and Heller's attachment style test. I feel like this maps onto the science the best. And of course, Levine and Heller wrote the book Attached, which I recommend that everybody get. I recommend, of course, that they get my book, Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps for My Wish to I Do for their actual dating plan. But a huge part of that plan is going to be knowing your style, knowing other people's styles, and quickly sussing out who will and won't work for you. So the first thing you need to do is know who you are. Yes, you need to know who you are and you need to look at your history. A lot of times, if you've had a bad relationship over and over and over. It's usually with the same kind of person over and over and over. And there's a reason that you're picking that. And a lot of times that reason is rooted in your fundamental way of being in an intimate partnership, i.e. your attachment style. That's the very definition. So there are four attachment styles. The first one is called secure. And we're going to go into some detail about what secure means because it's so important. But I want to like give you an overview of the other ones first. Okay. The Anxious style, which is the one I had for a long time, is a style where people are capable of and want a great love story in their life. They want intimacy. They want deep bonding with their person. And they have a fear that they will love their partner more than their partner loves them. They fear being abandoned. And that colors a lot of how anxious attachers behave, which we can also go into. Then there's the avoidant style of attachment. Avoidant style people want a partner, but, well, most of them do. Some are dismissive and they just don't want relationships at all. And you don't really need to worry about them because they're really not looking for anything serious. But fearful attachers, those folks want a partner, but they want them at arm's length. Just like anxious people are afraid of being abandoned, avoidant people are afraid of being smothered. They're afraid of being needed too much. And so the way that they look at their relational world, again, only with intimate partners, not with their children. You can't look at their children and say, oh, but they got a close relationship with their kids. I'm talking about your person. From the very beginning, they will do things that amount to, I want you in my life, but I also need to create some drama to create some distance so that you can't need me too much. I'm afraid of being needed too much and being depended on too much. And therefore I create distance. The word avoidant, you know, it's a little misleading because these folks actually don't just flat out avoid romance and avoid partners. What they avoid is genuine intimacy. And I'm going to define intimacy for you. Intimacy is gradually revealing everything about yourself. I've talked to people who say, yeah, I was with somebody that I only recently realized was avoidant and we did all these things that I would find myself thinking, well, we're doing things that really intimate people would do, but I don't feel close. I feel like there's a wall between us. I feel like there's a a hand up stopping me from getting any closer. I feel like there are topics we can't discuss. I feel like if I bring them up, this person's going to shut me out. As you say, true intimacy is revealing yourself little by little. Yeah. How about the person who just reveals everything so you feel close, but it's a false sense of intimacy? Yes. Beware the, the Vulcan mind belt. If someone is revealing 
everything about themselves, all their slings and arrows, all their pain, all their trauma, all their history, right up front, that person is not secure. Sometimes they're anxious, sometimes they're avoidant. Avoidant people, I don't think they're consciously aware of this, but they're, the non-conscious way, reason that they're doing this is if they really revealed nothing from the beginning, who's going to be with them? Nobody. There's research showing that over a four-year span of time, literally no avoidant people wound up with other avoidant people. That's not an option. They don't choose each other, ever. So they're left needing to either choose a secure person or an anxious person. Anxious people love it because anxious people are afraid that they won't get chosen. And here's this avoidant person saying, I pick you, I pick you, I pick you. I'm telling you everything. And it feels like intimacy, but in fact, it's often not because real intimacy comes as layers reveal themselves. That's right. A real intimacy looks more like layers of an onion or the preface of a book. When you get a book and it's a nonfiction book, the preface tells you, here's what we are going to cover. It doesn't go into great detail about any of it. It just says, here's what we're going to cover. And it's not lying to you. It's telling you the truth, just not everything. Similar to the outer layer of an onion. The outer layer of an onion is a real layer of the onion, but it's not at the center. Secure people reveal themselves in layers or stages. You'll hear something on your first phone call that's true. They're not lying to you. But later they'll tell the same story and there will be more detail. And even later they'll tell you the same story with much more detail as it makes sense. Think about it. When you first meet someone, does it make sense for them to reveal everything about themselves right away? Or sometimes to somebody who's really desperately looking for somebody, it feels good. So what happens, I think, is that it feels good. But when you step back, you think, well, that was inappropriate. Why did you tell me all that? But at the time, if you're lonely or your heart is lonely, it feels good. Yeah, I think that's where it gets confusing. This is why I give people the logic tool of does this make sense? It does feel good. Does it make sense? Look, if you if you're with somebody anxious, normally the experience will be one of being love bombed. They're just giving you way too much way too soon. They may say things about how amazing you are when they actually don't have the factual information to back that up. If you feel like this person is just coming on so strong and that they're making broad sweeping statements about your character that they don't have enough experience to be making, that's probably an anxious attacher. Or maybe that's just love at first light, sight. Is that possible, Duana? Yeah, but love at first sight is a different phenomenon, almost entirely experienced by men. There's research on this, and love at first sight is a real thing. And the research shows that people who experience love at first sight, it commonly does work out for a lifetime, and these people remain in love. It's usually the man who falls in love at first sight, and it's not necessarily the case that he love bombs the woman. He knows that she's his person, but he doesn't necessarily immediately tell her that that's the case because he's going to drive her away if she's secure. Can attachment styles change as we have experiences, as we get older, as people come into our lives? And and I want to preface it by saying not having understood attachment styles until the last couple of years, I could safely say when I think back, I don't think I was always a secure attachment style. When I look back to my relationships, not so sure I was. I know I was never avoidant, might have been a little anxious, but I'm extremely secure now, go figure. So I wonder how we change that. I think mine is a result of relationships, experiences, my own self-reflection. Does that happen? How does that happen? So most people have the same attachment style in the early 20s that they had as toddlers. And how we know that is there are scientists who gauged attachment style with toddlers and then waited 20 years and assessed it again in adulthood, in young adulthood. So we know that about 70% of people maintain the same attachment style from early life to at least early adulthood. We also know that over a four-year span of time, a hefty percent, and I'm not going to quote it because I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was north of 40% of people, their attachment style changed during that span of time during adulthood. So the answer is both and. Our initial attachment style is forged based on our relationships with intimate caregivers. Most of us have the same style in our early 20s that our mothers had. And that's partly genetic, but largely because our mothers treated us the way that they in turn were treated. But after that, 
our attachment style changes largely not because we're getting older, but because we're gaining experience. I'm just going to use myself as an example because I have permission to use myself as an example. I had a very secure attachment style coming into young adulthood, and I was in an intimate relationship where we got engaged. We hadn't yet told everybody that we were engaged, but I had known this young man since we were 10. So I trusted him completely. Well, he had fallen in love with somebody at his college and not told me. And he suddenly broke up with me, but didn't tell me why. And I found out later he had actually jilted me for another woman. And he gave her a ring. I thought it was the ring that was supposed to be mine. And that really messed with the foundation of my ability to trust, which is what your attachment style really is, right? But do you think that affected your choice going forward? Oh, absolutely. It affected my mate selection choices somewhat until very recently, actually. It didn't call all the shots because I do what I do for a living and I had a lot of knowledge by the time I was looking this time around. But where I'm going with that is it changed my style because of an experience. What I try to teach people to do is choose their experience, therefore choose their attachment style. The number one way that any of us can change our attachment style consciously is to pick a secure partner. Know what that looks like and pick a secure partner. Most people who choose a secure partner, if we're not already secure, we get something that researchers call earned security. We become secure because we are being treated so well with such a foundation of trust in such a trustworthy manner. We are safe to be completely who we are. This person accepts us utterly. They don't find fault with us. They're gentle with us when we do something wrong. That's how secure partners behave. And when we get that, it's like retro parenting. It's like getting all the good stuff that we always needed. And it tends to change people. The danger if you're a secure person hearing that, if you're secure, you can date anybody. The danger is if you date somebody who's avoidant, that you could go the other way. You could actually become anxious instead of keeping your security, just like I became anxious. So you're taking a risk, but you can date anyone. I will say this for sure. The rest of us, anxious attachers, avoidant attachers, we must choose someone secure if we're going to have best possible outcomes for us becoming more secure. You just have to, which means you need to know what secure looks like. You know how in diamonds, there are four C's, there's cut, clarity, color, and carrot. There are four C's to buying a diamond. There are four C's to choosing someone secure. Secure people are clear. Their communication is very clear. If you're getting the feeling like you're talking in circles, this person never seems to quite understand what it is you need. They make the problem about you instead of actually addressing what you're talking about. They say, well, you're just too needy. You're just too sensitive. Or or they say, but I did this, so this other thing shouldn't matter. That person's not secure. Secure people are very clear in their communication. They really listen when you talk and they clearly address what it is that you are asking about or needing. No mind reading involved. Correct. And no blaming. They don't blame you for the issue that you just brought up that you needed fixed. They're clear. That's C number one. They're calm. If you're an anxious attacher, you are looking for someone who makes you feel understood and appreciated and possibly even loved right away. These are the folks who get into what I call mini marriages, having way too much intimacy much too quickly putting all their laser beam attention on just one candidate as soon as they meet them. Look, Carrie is the love of my life. I adore him and I didn't give him all of my attention right away. Even though I've been doing this job so long that I was like, oh, he's secure. He's got a lot of what you need. Withhold your judgment. Keep seeing other people for a while until he proves it. He was calm though. And here's the thing. This is where I'm going with you anxious attachers out there. A secure person will not make you feel like they get you right away. They will not make you feel like they love you right away because they don't, because they don't know you yet. They're calm. And it's unrealistic to expect that. Yeah. In fact, false sense of intimacy. Yes. And the reason I want you to understand this, like in your gut is anxious attachers look for drama. They confuse drama with love. The secure person will feel boring to you. They're not boring. They're calm. They're not boring. They're just not bringing the drama. They're not boring. They're being reasonable. They're not boring. So anxious attachers, if you start to feel bored, it's so funny. I hear this again and again, the following statement. I've met a lot of guys who seem to have what I wanted, but you know, I just didn't feel anything for them. I promise you, you're anxious and they were secure. Because people identify intimacy, as drama, as intensity, as all the things that really is the opposite of intimacy in my experience. Well, people don't. 
anxious people do. Anxious people Secure do. people don't do that. So when you were asking about percentages of how many people, I told you the general population. Let me tell you something else. When you're dating, especially at midlife and beyond, your folks have been through a divorce. They're not usually in their 20s anymore. Right. If you're di- dating anywhere north of the age of, say, 35 to 38. How about north of 60? Or north of 60. I've got a lot of clients who have found the love of their lives after age 50 or 60. Men but aren't a lot of the secure people already in long-term relationships? Secure people tend to get snapped up in their 20s to very early 30s and stay in that relationship for the rest of their lives. So the general population has a hefty percentage of secure folks in it, but the dating population at 35 and beyond doesn't, True. which is why I want you to learn what secure looks like backward, forward, inside and out, where I could quiz you, what's this behavior look like? And you can say, this is what that is. And I do that with my clients because I want them to have a happy life and a secure person stands the best shot of giving them that. By the way, I'm not saying avoidant people aren't worthwhile people. I'm not saying anxious people aren't worthwhile people. I'm an anxious person. What I'm saying is if you want a happy life, your best shot is to choose someone. If you're not secure, choose someone secure. That's your best shot. My experience with an avoidant person, the person wasn't a bad person. And in fact, they had all of my desired traits list. They just weren't a person that you could have a meaningful relationship with. Doesn't make them bad. It's just not somebody you want to invest time and energy in. It's a very different thing. Whoever this was, wasn't right for you. There's a secure attacher out there somewhere who's willing to do the work. Absolutely. And that's great. I am not saying that these people won't make a match for anyone. But I am saying, if you know that you want a relationship where there's a great deal of closeness and no drama, you will pick someone secure, period. So we have clear, we have calm. They're clear, they're calm, and they're consistent. Consistent. This is another thing that anxious attachers especially confuse with boredom. If a secure attacher calls you three times in a row at 7.30 at night, they're going to call you the next night at 7.30 at night. They're consistent. If a secure attacher calls you when they get home from their date just or texts you to let you know that they're okay, they're going to do it next time. They're consistent. You can depend on them. They're not going to do what I've seen happen numerous times with clients of mine where the avoidant person does something three or four times and then the anxious person says, you didn't do that thing today that you always do. And the avoidant person says, you shouldn't expect me to do that. Well, yeah, you should. Why? They created a behavioral contract that they were going to do that. So what you're saying, and this is the hard part of dating, is you need to be patient to discover who somebody is because understanding consistency takes time and you have to observe it. Uh, seeing consistent calmness and clarity, you have to pay attention, listen. And if you see that pattern, you know you have a secure person. If you follow this advice, or if you understand uh, attachment styles, social sciences, you will 100% meet somebody. And when you demystify it, it's life-changing. I, I, and I, I, I know I sound almost naive to say this at 65 years old, but it really is not that complicated. I have clients who are 70 who, for the first time in their lives, have the love that they wanted. First time ever have the love that they wanted. The whole reason that I do what I do, the whole reason I wrote my books, the whole reason I have a client practice is there are fairly simple steps that you can take. It won't be easy, but there are simple science-based steps that you can take that will transform your love life so you're happy. I want people to be happy. Can you imagine what our world would be like if everyone in it felt loved and safe? Thank you again for being with us. I look forward to our continued conversations. They're always extremely enlightening. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito.